All right, in chapter nine, we have been looking at the value of having two samples and being able to compare the statistics that you get from those. In 9.1, we looked at proportions, and in 9.2, we looked at means. Um, and in 9.3, we start to explore uh, what we call dependent samples. Up till now, um, everything has been independent. The, the data from um, the two samples were in no way connected. Um, in this section, we are going to be looking at uh, what it looks like to have dependent samples or what's called matched pairs. So we've sort of got three objectives. We're going to um, identify sample data consisting of matched pairs, and then we're going to look at uh, hypothesis testing and building confidence interval estimates um, with that data. So as we get started, let me sort of explain um, what we're talking about or, or hopefully uh, explain how this would be, why it's valuable that they be matched. So when designing an experiment or planning an observational study, using dependent samples is generally better than using independent samples. And here's an example of why. So let's say we wanted to test the effectiveness of an SAT test prep program. So if I just um, did two independent samples, I would consider uh, those um, scores of people that took the program. So I, I take a bunch of random samples of SAT scores of students that had been through the program and what their score was, and then I'd grab a bunch of random scores from students who did not take the program, and then I could um, look at their average uh, test score of those two groups and compare. However, when they are independent, um, I think you can see that there's lots of other variables going on here. And there's lots of other reasons uh, or things that could impact the mean score of these students. Um, it's possible that a bunch of the students that did not take the program were students from a uh, like college prep school that you know are super smart and have been trained for this test throughout their whole entire career. Or um, it's possible, you know, there's just so many things that can potentially impact uh, maybe one of the averages is higher than the other, but how do we know it really is because they took the um, test prep program as opposed to some other factor. Now if I just change how I'm taking my samples and I look at um, if I want to make these dependent, well I could compare students' scores before they took the SAT test prep program and then those same student scores after. So I'd end up with um, data um, maybe here's student number one, and before they, they took the SAT and hadn't taken a program, and maybe they scored a 510 on their SAT, and then after they took the program, they got a few more points um, and got a, a 550. That would indicate that the, the program maybe um, helped them out a bit. Student number two, something similar, maybe I'm just keeping the numbers easy. Uh, oops, I didn't mean to put a number two. This is the same student. So student one before and after the test, student two before and after the test. And then I would have all of these scores of students and maybe they didn't all, um, their scores didn't all increase. I'm just making some numbers up, right? Um, maybe some after they took the SAT program, perhaps the score went down. Uh, but now that these are matched, I don't necessarily have to calculate uh, each individual group's average test score, what I'd want to look at is the difference between their test scores before and after. So for example, here, um, if I just subtract, you'll, you'll see in the notation, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, in this notation when we're talking about dependent samples, um, we have a new variable that we haven't had uh, with this D, which is talking about the difference between two values in a matched pair. So what that means here, if I were to subtract 510 minus 550, right, that's the difference, uh, that would be negative 40. And that negative 40 represents the change in their score from before and after. Now I can see the student scored 40 points more after, but because of the direction of my subtraction, there is a negative sign in front of it. That's okay, if it just really makes you uncomfortable, you could, do, you could go backwards, 550 minus 510, and it would be a positive 40. 
but just for ease of not having to rewrite this um, and because this is how they all show up um, in the examples, um, I'll just go in order. 70 minus 750 would be a negative 50. 580 minus 540 would be a positive 40 and so on. And I would, could do this for, or have a computer do it for all of my samples. And I'd end up with this column, whoops, didn't mean to put the bar on there, this column of differences. The difference in their before score from their after score. And I'm just making a note that negative actually means they gained that points on, on their test and positive is the points um, that they lost after taking the test. But then I could find the average or the mean of all of my Ds, right? divided by however many of them there are. Um, and that would give me an average. Now in this case, if the average, when I'm done with this, is a negative value, that would say on average, students are doing better after they take the SAT test prep program, so therefore it's effective. Now again, we have to consider um, what's significant enough. Uh, to some extent, you would expect that people would do better the second time they took the test in, in general um, anyway, just because they've seen it once before. So it would have to be significant enough, hence the need for a hypothesis test um, as, you know, to test that claim. But that's how I would, um, that's how this is done when they're two, two uh, matched pairs. You're um, looking at the differences between the two values in a single matched pair and then finding the mean value of the differences. Now my u sub d here, mu sub d um, is the mean value of the differences for the population of all matched pairs of the data. So you are using this process to um, come up with a, a mean value of the differences for a population, um, not just the sample. And then s sub d is the standard deviation used for the pairs of sample data. Um, we don't find this, but if you wanted the standard deviation for uh, the population, it would be sigma sub d, but just a notation reminder. All right, just like with um, all means, these requirements are the same with one exception. So usually the sample data needs to be independent, but if you're looking um, at dependent samples, then uh, the sample data would need to be matched pairs. Um, it must be a simple random sample as usual. And then just a reminder, that um, we expect that either the sample data is large, more than um, 30 samples, or the population comes from a distribution that is approximately normal. It's mostly normal, but um, with means, it's pretty generous. Uh, this is a pretty loose requirement. So even if it's off, usually these um, methods will get you uh, good answers anyway. So let's just look at one of the examples that you'll see in your assignment. Um, this first example, uh, just sort of make sure you understand the process and the notation more than actually doing a hypothesis test um, or confidence interval at this point. So just to sort of warm up, I've got body temperatures from five different subjects. They, they took their temperatures at 8 a.m. and then again at 12 a.m. And they want us to find the value, the mean value of all the differences and the standard deviation of those uh, differences. So what you're doing, like I did before, I have five subjects. So here's per subject number one. They had a temperature of 97.8 at 8 a.m. in the morning. And then their temperature went up a little bit by 12 um, a.m. So... Oh, it's 12 a.m. I was thinking p.m. Um, so however, however that works, that's my first subject, second subject, third, fourth. So those are my five people that I've taken their temperatures at two different times of day. And we don't really know the context of what we're, what we're exploring here. Perhaps they gave them some medication that was supposed to increase or decrease their temperature. We're not really sure. So the first thing I want to do is find the mean of the differences and the standard deviation of the differences. And of course, StatCrunch can do that for you. Um, that can be very involved uh, because the first thing I need to do is calculate the difference, all the little Ds um, here. So you can make StatCrunch do that. Um, I, I, I'm sure you see this little button and if you want to pull in all those values and then make StatCrunch subtract them all, you can. Um, we haven't done that a lot, and it's a pretty, like, it would have taken me five pages to explain. So 
I would recommend um, perhaps just, I mean, this is easy enough, grab a calculator, it's only five points. You can calculate the individual differences pretty easily. 97.8 minus 98.4 is negative 0.6. 99.4 minus 100, again, negative 0.6. Um, so just as a note, these temperatures, uh, and again, at 12 a.m., I assume that's of the same day. So that would have been the temperature at 12 a.m. and you know, midnight, and then 8 a.m. would have been the later temperature if, if, if that's how that works. So um, it looks like these people's temperatures dropped 0.6 of a degree, 97.1 minus 97.5. And all I'm doing is subtracting these numbers. That's positive, 0.2, um, and negative 0.3. So those are all my individual differences. And again, you could probably calculate the mean by hand if you really wanted to. I'm just gonna take all these numbers, right, and divide by five, add them up, divide by five. That would be doing it by hand. Um, and that will get you the right answer. Uh, but you could also at this point open up StatCrunch and just create your own column and let StatCrunch, since you have to find the standard deviation anyway, which is a little harder to do by hand, and I've never made you do by hand before, you could open up StatCrunch and just copy those in there. Um, you could also have, you know, uh, pulled them all in. Um, you can see I went ahead and pulled the, those all in to um, and then how to call them for the differences, totally up to you what level of detail you want to do. And I'm just trying to find the mean of those numbers. So I'm gonna go to summary stats. That is a column of data. So I'm gonna pick column. And then all I care about is I want to, to find the mean of the differences column. If you have multiple columns, that could be the only column you had. And I'm trying to calculate the mean and the standard deviation of a sample. So I just pick those two. And when I do that, I get my answers right here and I can go back up and plug those in. This is my D bar, my mean of my differences, and this is my S sub D, the standard deviation. Um, and I plug those in and got that part done. And then it asks in general, what does mu sub D represent? And again, you can flip back up um, to the definitions that I gave you on the previous page, read through those, and remember that mu d is the mean of the differences of the population of matched data. That's what that would represent. They didn't ask us to estimate that. Um, they didn't give us a claim for that, uh, but we're just sort of reviewing that we know what that would be. All right, before we do, I have two examples, one um, with a hypothesis test and one with a confidence interval. Um, before we do those two questions, I just want to practice uh, recognizing what the claim is that is being made and how to write that in um, you know, this notation just so when you go to do a hypothesis test and you need to plug that in, um, it sort of starts to make sense. So it's important that you read through these examples because later you're going to have other problems that you have to read through the examples and that's probably what you're going to get stuck on. So I have a list of the ages of random selection of actresses when they won an award in the category of Best Actress, along with the age of the actor that won the award in the category of Best Actor. So these, this data is matched um, according to the a year the award was presented. So I don't know what year it is, I don't really care what year it is, but in this year we had a 27-year-old actress and a 57-year-old actor who won those awards. Actress significantly younger than actor. Um, and then I can see for all the you know corresponding years um, the ages of actress and actor, and they're asking me to use this data to test the claim. Here's the important words: that the population of ages for best actress and best act for that population of that that I have above, the differences have a mean less than zero. So the claim is. The population has a mean that is less than zero. Oops, I put equals and I meant less than. That is less than zero. So that would be my claim. That's easy enough to understand. But then turning around and um, understanding what that's telling you is important. If the differences are less than zero, um, let's 
consider what these differences would be. 27 minus 57 is negative 30. That's definitely a number less than, than zero. And what that's saying is the actress is younger by 30 years. So less than zero is indicating if this is negative. That's what that's telling you. Remember, it's important to connect the dots between less than zero and negative or greater than zero and positive. So if the mean, if after adding and finding all of these numbers, I find the mean, and if this mean, this number over here is negative, it means the actresses are generally younger than the actors. If it's positive, it means the actor is generally um, uh, younger than the actress. So I know that it tells you right here what it means, but they don't all do that. So I want you to um, get used to sort of thinking through what that means if, that, if the mean is positive or negative. And how you think that through or how you figure that out is to look at what it was you're subtracting and what a negative would mean versus what a positive would mean. So look at B and C perhaps, see if you can write the claim and see if you can um, understand what the claim is telling you and then restart the video and we can talk about it. So there's a theory that presidential candidates have an advantage if they are taller than their main opponent. So you can see the heights of, of certain presidents and then the height of their main opponent. And as you just glance at them, you can see that generally the, the president, the guy that won, tended to be taller in almost all cases but this one, right? They were taller. So we're trying to determine if that really is a significant, um, uh, show a significant advantage. Now, again, we're not doing the whole entire test. We're just wanting to write the claim. I want to test the claim that the population of heights for presidents and their main opponents, the differences have a mean greater than zero. So in this one, I'm testing this claim. That the differences um, have a mean greater than zero. Again, if I look at 176 minus 162, I don't know what that is, but it's definitely positive. Uh, if I subtract, this is positive, this is positive. So any difference that ends up being positive supports the president, the winner, is taller. That's what we're looking at, and that's what a difference of greater than zero would mean. In the last one, we've got a before and after. You've got people that have pain, and then they receive a hypnosis session, and we're, we're looking to see if um, there's a significant level of people that have decreased pain after being hypnotized. So they're asking you to construct a hypothesis interval, but for our purposes, again, we are just um, writing the claim. So this one is um, a little bit harder. Uh, I don't even see the words the claim. Do you? Yeah, there's no uh, words that say, test the claim that, but notice the question, does it appear to be effective in reducing pain? So this is where we were going. I want to decide what the differences should be if it is effective. Now, if it's effective in reducing pain, that means this should be smaller and this would be larger, right, in general. And we can see that for the most part it is. Um, and if, if the first number is larger and you subtract a smaller number, you're going to get a positive um, every time. The only time you're going to get a negative is if you're subtracting a smaller number on top than a bottom uh, than the number on the bigger number on bottom so if we were testing the claim that it does seem to be effective in re reducing pain then we would want the average of the distance differences the mean of the differences to be positive which is greater than zero that would be the claim that we are testing if we, if the difference was less than zero if it was negative numbers that would mean they have more pain after receiving the hypnosis than before all right, so two last questions, um, actually working through, uh, in this case, looking for a confidence interval, and then the last one, doing a hypothesis test. So in this example, we are comparing the number of hospital admissions resulting from motor vehicle crashes um, on Friday the 13th. We're looking to see if, in general, uh, there are more crashes on Friday the 13th than other Fridays. So uh, if, if there was a month with a Friday the 13th, then the Friday before that would be the Friday the 6th. So you can see there's one, two, three, four, five different months that we've tested and the number of admissions 
um, the Friday before the 13th, just on the 6th, versus the number of admissions at that same hospital on Friday the 13th. And as you glance at it, you can see that it does appear that there are more admissions on Friday the 13th. So I want to, as I read through this, um, I want to find a 95% confidence interval. Notice they are telling you they want you to take Friday the 6th minus Friday the 13th. So you're going to go 6th minus the 13th. This would give you negative 6. 6 minus 15 would give you negative 9 and so on. Uh, a negative means more on Friday the 13th, right? So if um, the, the interval that you create is mostly negative, then that would support the idea that there seem to be more admissions on Friday the 13th. Um, if it's zero, then there seems to be no difference between how many show up on the 6th and how many show up on the 15th. And if it's positive, then the, the, how many people show up on the 6th would be greater. So we are going to use um, StatCrunch for this. Uh, I don't want to type in all that data, so you are going to copy that into StatCrunch, which will pull those things here and here. Those are my number of admissions on each of those days of the month. Um, this is a mean, so we are looking at t-stats, and we do have two samples. Now when you do that, it's going to open up the information that you'll plug in, and for some reason I didn't add that. Um, on this chart, but you've done this a lot, so hopefully that doesn't cause you any difficulty. Make sure you plug in 95% for your confidence interval, um, and you get your lower and upper limit. So we are 95% confident that the mean difference falls somewhere in between negative 8.5 and negative 3.8. I didn't necessarily round correctly when I, what I said, but that's what it would look like. Both are negative. So it does appear um, that more people show up on the 6th. So I'm asked, based on the confidence interval, can one reject the claim that when you have a 13th day of a month falls on a Friday, the number of hospital emissions from motor vehicles are not affected? Notice it doesn't say they increased or decreased. They're just saying um, that, they, that there isn't a difference. Can we claim that there isn't a difference between the 13th of the uh, Friday the 13th versus any other Friday? And I would say, um, no, we cannot. Uh, wait, let me. Can we reject it? Let me see if I read that right again. Can one reject the claim that they're not affected? And I would say yes, you can reject that claim. It appears that they um, are definitely uh, affected. So I would say yes, we can reject the claim because the confidence interval does not include zero, right? Zero being in there would mean that there is no difference, there is zero difference, and since um, zero isn't a part of that, then something definitely is happening here, and we know that the number of crashes are being um, are increasing because it was a negative number. Last question, example three. Um, you have here uh, the attribute ratings from sample participants in a speed dating session. So you have um, the ratings of males by females. So these are the way the females rated um, all their, their male speed dating people. And then these are the ratings of the females by males. So they have rated them on sincerity, intelligence, fun, ambition, and shared interests. And then they have added up all of their ratings. So the higher the rating, you know, the, the better they are and all of those things, I suppose. Um, and we are asked to use, to test a claim that there is a difference between female attribute ratings and male attribute ratings. So we're looking to see if females tend to rate their male dates higher than male dates tend to rate female dates. So this data is a little bit harder for me to just glance at and see if there appears to be a difference. But what I'm looking for... Um, well, let's just jump in to pull this data in uh, StatCrunch. If I was creating a confidence interval, um, I would be, again, looking for if zero falls in that interval or not. But we are doing a hypothesis test, so let's look at how that's different. So I open up all my data. Where did I put it? I open up my data. Remember, you're going to go to StatCrunch, T-Stats, Pair Data, or two samples, 
Um, and then I'm going to pull in uh, sample one is the rating of males by females, and sample two is the rating of males by um, males. And I didn't delete this before, um, but as I'm looking at what the claim is, so I'm testing the claim that there is a difference. So that means this, uh, the claim is that there is a difference, so it can't be zero. Uh, if there is no difference, that this means there's no difference, right? So that is not the claim. Uh, this is my claim. Now, the, you, we could have said we want to test the claim that females rate higher or males rate higher, and then we do greater than or less than depending on which way we subtracted. But in this case, they are not identifying which one tends to rate higher. We just want to see if there's a difference between how females rate males or males rate females in speed dating. So our, this is um, our claim. Now, when I go to fill in my hypothesis test down here, hypothesis test, my null hypothesis is always equals, and in this case, it would be zero. So this is my null. Whoops, not n. H sub zero. That's my null hypothesis. And then my alternate hypothesis is what my claim is. So in this case, I'm just going to write that down here. If I reject the null, that means I'm supporting the claim. If I fail to reject the null, then I am um, not supporting my claim. All right. I need my test statistic and my p-value. That comes from my hypothesis test down here. So I plugged those values in. I um, hit equals, and I get my test statistic and my p-value, and I come back over here and plug those in. And then I got to think about what that means. So in order for me to really use the test statistic, I would need my critical values, and I don't have those handy, and I don't want to go look for them, so I'm just going to worry about the p-value to answer the question. And the p-value is 57%. I shouldn't have put p that it says p-value. P is different. Um, and then I compare that to alpha, and alpha, they said, was 0 0.05. And remember, you're always comparing if P is greater than alpha, if P is high, and P is definitely higher than alpha, the null will fly. So we are failing to reject the null. Right, we, we, this is good. There, there does appear to be no difference is what that is telling us. Um, so when I come down here and pick my answers, since the p-value is, I would say it's higher, I guess my choices are greater than the significance level, we are going to fail to reject the null hypothesis and say if the difference equals zero, then there is not sufficient evidence to support the claim that there is a difference between how females rate males and males rate females. All right, I hope that helps. Um, good luck on this homework, and as always, let me know if I can help or if you have any questions.